the discussion we had before, and just to refresh your memory, that Moses asked for certain things, right? Moses asked for a couple of things from God, three things from God. Um, and according to Rabbi Meir, two of Moses' requests were granted, but one was not granted to him. God granted to him that the divine presence would rest upon Israel and not leave, and that the divine presence would not rest upon the other nations of the world. Those were two of the, the things he asked for. But God did not reveal to Moses the ways in which he conducts the world. So he did not give Moses that extra information that God wanted, when, when, that Moses wanted. When he said to God, I want to see you, right? Because it says, and this is where it goes back to the text, as it is said, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. In his mercy, God bestows his grace upon every person, even though he's not worthy. Similarly, God says, I will have mercy upon him who I will have mercy, even though he is not worthy. According to Rabbi Mayer, the way in which God conducts the world and bestows grace and mercy was not revealed even to Moses. Well, what's interesting, of course, is that this is an issue that everybody has, not just Moses. Everybody wants to know why God does what God does. And essentially, Moses, even Moses, doesn't get that. Now, the good news is, is that Technically speaking, we're not worthy of anything that God should give us. They recognize that. It's basically like human beings are just not worthy of this stuff, yet God does it. So God is merciful, it's just God doesn't show us everything. Now, we're going to get into something that I think is really interesting because why would Moses, though, still be deprived, even though God told him a lot of stuff, God didn't, would not tell him everything. So here's what it says. The Gemara continues to cite the sages' explanations of verses that require clarification on that topic with regard to God's statement to Moses. Again, this is not in the text, the part that's not pulled. We return, but they're, they're helping us, reminding us what's going on. So the quote that comes from the same scene from the Bible, which is on Mount Sinai, when the people are sitting with the golden calf and Moses is up there on Mount Sinai talking to God, right? God said to Moses, you cannot see my face, right? Because the rest of the line says, and that's why it's still in quotes, for man shall not see me and live. Right? That's what God says to Moses. Now, it was taught in the name of Rabbi Yoshua ben Korcha that the Holy One, blessed be he, said to Moses as follows. 
So check this out. This is what he was taught why this happens. When I wanted to show you my glory in the burning bush, back when you first met me, in chapter 3 of Exodus, you did not want to see it. As it is stated, and Moses concealed his face, fearing to gaze upon God. It's right there at the beginning, right? If you go back to Exodus, to the burning bush, Moses says, I don't want to see you. But now you want to see my glory? As you said, show me your glory. I do not want to show it to you. Rabbi Yoshua ben Korcha interprets, interprets Moses' initial refusal to look upon God's glory negatively as he rebuffed God's desire to be close to him. So God says, you wanted, you didn't want me then, and now you want me? Ain't gonna happen. Because remember, he sees God's back. We're going to talk about that. We're going to have a reminder of that. But yes, remember, he says to him, I'm going to let you see something, but you're not going to see my face. And the understanding of what seeing my face is, is really beholding God, really taking in God, really understanding God comprehending God's ways. Seeing God face to face is knowing God. And God said, you can't know. Yes. So, so look, we know that this is not the last statement. I don't know. You can figure it out. This is not the last statement about this. But they find a textual reason, the rabbis find a textual reason for why God would say, sorry, you don't get it. You want it. I wanted to show it to you. You didn't want it. It's too late now. Which is making God seem a little petty. But the interesting thing here is they found a text which actually would allow God to say that. You know, you had your chance, and you didn't want to know me. Now you want to know me? Which, by the way, it does, it's just not, it's not just petty. There's an answer there, which is that if you had had ultimate faith in me when I first met you at the burning bush, we wouldn't be having this discussion today. He had full fear, but he didn't have full faith. He was scared, but he didn't have love. And he didn't have... Oh, no question, but that's not an issue of like what the rest of the people have. He, the Bible says he spoke to God and he was afraid of God and didn't want to see God. Now he wants to see God. So the rabbis point out this interesting distinction. There was a time, and again, you can make the argument, so he developed his faith. He didn't have it, and now he does. You know, you can't hold him accountable, which again would make God seem petty. Okay, but here's the thing, which we know. We've read the Bible enough. Everyone here has read the Bible enough. I'm just going to remind you. There are 
characters in the Bible who seem to be able to take to have faith in God maybe a little bit more right up front. Which kind of begs the question, which the rabbis kind of opened up, which is, did God have to prove himself to Moses? Which, by the way, is kind of intimated in the movie. It's kind of intimated in the movie Prince of Egypt, which is that the whole concept that they say when you believe, that's the song, you will, there will be miracles when you believe, right? That's the, the lesson is that the people had to believe, but Moses had to believe too. And the people had to believe. And the reason that the movie argues, and, and like we understand this, the reason that they didn't believe is because they spent hundreds of years as slaves and had given up on God. Well, he didn't even, yes. So he didn't even have a reason to believe. He didn't even have a context for that. But his family had kind of given up, except for Miriam, by the way. Aaron gave up. Miriam hadn't given up. And, was still, and that's, by the way, part of that. Look, I mean, I think to some extent they were trying to make Miriam the hero, which is great. I mean, it's definitely trying to focus on women heroes of the Bible, which we're going to see today, by the way. It's not a modern, woke idea. The rabbis do it thousands of years ago. But there is, there was an intention to make Miriam the hero, and Aaron, Aaron looks a little bit like a schnook. Wow. Who, by the way, is the only Jewish voice in the movie is Jeff Goldblum. The only Jewish voice. Miriam is voiced by Sandra Bullock. Tipora, who isn't Jewish anyway, she's she's Midianite, but she's voiced by Michelle Pfeiffer. And uh, Val Kilmer is Moses. Yeah. yeah. Anyways, the point is, is that the people of Israel don't really have faith. But, again, Moses not having faith at the beginning, having fear but not really faith, to some extent says, okay, God is saying, the implication is, God says to Moses now, at Mount Sinai, when he, they're come back now, years later, and now the game that now they're getting the Ten Commandments. It's easy for you to have faith in me now, Moses. You've just spent all those days in Egypt with me performing miracles and splitting the Red Sea. And now you come to me and you want to see me? Where were you when I was talking to you out of a bush? And so they knew that. The rabbis kind of put that into our minds, which is, do we have faith? Did Moses have faith? But again, that's not the end of it. That's not the last word. So here's the 
here's here's specifically the differences of opinion. This disagrees with that which Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said, that Rabbi Yonatan said, as Rabbi Shmuel Bar Nachmani said, that Rabbi Yonatan said, which you don't always see that, which is that two people say that Rabbi Yonatan, two people said that Rabbi Yonatan said, specifically as a reward for three acts of humility in averting his glance at the burning bush, Moses was privileged to experience three great revelations. So not that God punished him at, at the burning bush, but actually rewarded him at the burning bush. So it's not that he God withheld for, from that act, action. Actually, Moses actually proved himself in that action, which is kind of what Glory was saying, which is he showed his fear. He showed his humility at that moment. Yes. And because Moses concealed his face, fearing to gaze upon God, he was privileged to have the countenance glow, which is what Mike just said. When he comes off of the Mount Sinai at this point, he's actually glowing. Because he feared, right? That's what Glory said. He was privileged that they feared to approach him, which is, which is what the Bible says that the people felt after he had that glow, right? No, they never show that. Because what? Yeah. Yeah, which you couldn't have been, right? You would have had to have been 80, 80 something years old when this happens. And not only that, because he's 80 years old when he starts the Exodus. So even though this happened not long after, he's 80, 80 in a few months at this point. But they never want to show Moses wearing a veil for the rest of his life, which is what it says he did. Or at least when he came out with the people, he was wearing a veil. He was wearing something over his face every time. And nobody ever shows that in a movie. So, two things so far. He, he was glowing. And... Uh, and and the people were 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 fearful of him, and then because he did not gaze, he was privileged to behold the likeness of the Lord, which is kind of again the description of what happens to him when he sees something of God. Now. Uh, I just point out one interesting thing here with the Hebrew, the Hebrew word here. Um, Moses hid his face, right, by his stare. He talked about that word hiding, hiding the face. God hides his face. 
Moses hides his face. But what's interesting here too is that because of that, he merited Le Calaster, the Calister. Now you can see that word Calister is clearly a Greek word. And so this is an example of when we read this Hebrew, when we get to this time in history that we see Greek words, um, um, popping their way into the text. Anyways. So, now we're going to get into what Moses saw when he didn't see God's face, but beheld some parts of this. So here's what it says. What did Moses see? It is said, and I will remove my hand and you will see my back. That's the actual line. But my face you will not see. That's, that's the whole part of it. Rav Khanna Bar Business said in the name of Rav Shimon Chasfide, the expression, and you will see my back, should be as understood as follows. This teaches the Holy One, blessed be he, who is mentioned above, wears to fill in, right? Showed in the knot of the phylacteries of the tefillin on the, on the back of his head, which is worn on the back, you know, that we have. I showed you that. That's the, the knot that's on the back. So what did Moses see? He saw the back of God's tefillin. That's all he saw. So again, we heard about the tefillin before, and now they've woven it back in. This is the way the text weaves things together in a very creative way, in a very powerful way, like of complexity, where like if you're watching a movie or you're listening to a comedian, a great comedian tell jokes, and then he brings back the joke from the, you know, from ten minutes ago. That's what just happened. You see that in a movie where you see a character come back and you realize, oh, now I know why that character was there. So there's Moses, and the and he gets to see. God's uh, villain. So they, they wore that back in. Amazing. On this subject, Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Yossi, every statement to a person or to a nation that emerged from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed be he, with the promise of good, even if it was conditional, he did not renege on it. Ultimately, every promise made by God will be fulfilled. Now that is a key idea in Jewish philosophy, in Jewish theology, in Jewish concept is the rabbis just said that God, if God promises something for good, it says there completely, latova, for good, even if it was conditioned on something you have to do, God will deliver it. Even if you don't even if you don't deserve it now, maybe one day you'll deserve it 
and God will deliver it. This idea keeps us alive for 2,000 years of exile. If God promises we're going to return to the land of Israel and be at peace, we'll get it. Why? Because God told us it would. And God promises something good, we'll get it. Now you can ask the question, well, what if God promises something bad? Will God deliver the bad on the bad, the curse? That's also going to be dealt with. But of course, this idea that there's a hope for God's promises is really, really important for us. Because they said, and that's why it, look, it doesn't say in here to a person or to a nation, but the rabbis know that you're going to ask that question. Is that if God says it to Moses or if God says it to King David or, I mean, if God says it to Abraham? But what if God says it to all of us? And they say, if it's to a person or to us, it's going to come. It's going to come true. So God will make those those promises will come true. Even if you don't meet the conditions. Quite frankly, maybe one day you might meet those conditions. But we're going to get to this now. So the rabbis just threw out a really bold statement, which is that all these promises are going to be delivered on? Like, that's crazy. Can you really... Can, could that really have happened? So they say, where do we derive this? Where do we derive that all of God's so this is this is this is the famous phrase in the Talmud Bonalon. Where do we get this from? How can we prove this? We know this from Moses, our teacher. As God promised and said, leave me alone, I will destroy them and blot out their name from under heaven. And I will make from you a nation mightier and greater than they. And that is what happened according to Deuteronomy at Mount Sinai when God kind of just gave up on the people and said, I'm going to wipe them all out. Now, a similar thing is said next to this, but Deuteronomy says it very clearly. And they quoted the Deuteronomy version of it, which is Moses... I'm going to start out and make a great nation out of you. The golden calf. I'm going to wipe them out here at Mount Sinai, right? Start over with you. And it says, even though Moses prayed to have the decree repealed, and it was nullified, the promise was fulfilled, right? Because Moses' descendants became a nation mightier and greater than the 600 Israelites in the desert. What? So there's 600,000 people in the desert, but it says that Moses' descendants become more than the 600,000. Well, how, how do they even get that? 
as it is stated with regard to the Levites, the sons of Moses, and when they're going through the, Lev the Levitical tribe, Gershom and Eliezer, the sons of Moses, and the sons of Eliezer, Oh, so the the sons of the sons of Moses, Gershom and Eliezer. So he had two, the two sons, and then it says the sons of Gershom, and then it goes to the sons of Eliezer, the second one, were Rechavia the chief, and Eliezer had no other sons. And the sons of Rechavia were very many. So all it says in Hebrew is very many. Okay? But it says, whenever the Bible says something like that, Rabbi Yosef taught in Brighton, many means more than 600,000. This is learned from a verbal analogy between the words many and many. So whenever it says the word many, it is written here with regard to Rechavia's sons were very many, and it was written there with regard to the Israelites in Egypt, and the children of Israel became numerous and multiplied and were very many, right? Which is what we read about why the Egyptians started panicking. The same words are used there. The same words are used. They became very many. So just as when the children of Israel were in Egypt, were very many, meant there were 600,000 of them, so too the descendants of Rechavia were 600,000. And they got it right from here. It says, Revia and Revia. So any time you see the word Revia, it's there's 600,000. Now, that's a kind of a crazy idea, right? That, that Moses has that many descendants. Now, because the, that we had this interesting, some of these interesting texts that were laid down by Rabbi Yochanan in the name of Rabbi Yossi, that's where we started, or didn't start, but kind of what was introduced to us. Until now, the Gemara has cited statements made by Rabbi Yochanan in the name of, of the Tana Rabbi Yossi, one of, again, one of the older, uh, the Tanaim, one of the rabbis from the Mishnah. Now, the Gemara begins to cite what Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of another one of those Tanaim, a very famous one, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, or Ben Yochai. Same guy. This is the guy whose yard site we just celebrated at Tisha at. Uh, at the log of Omer. From the day that the Holy One, blessed be he, be he, created the world, there was no person who called him Lord until Abraham came and called him Lord, as it is stated. And he said, my Lord God, by what shall I know that I will inherit it? And this is the, interestingly, this is the text I shared last week at Shavuot, 
which is when Moses, or excuse me, when Abraham is promised by God that he will make him a great and numerous nation, he says, well, how will I know that I will inherit it? Well, what's interesting is, is that Abraham, in chapter 15, is the first human being who says to God, Adonai Elohim. So Abraham, because he's in the Bible and because it's recounted, according to that, the rabbis derive ever since creation, which was a long time before Abraham, they know that. They know there's many generations and those people lived a really long time. So if you're talking about you know, thousands of years, literally like already by that point, 2,000, over 2,000 years before Abraham. No person ever created ever said the words Adonai Elohim. No one ever said that. No one called God by his or by God's name. He was the first. That's a pretty significant thing. God, Abraham was the first person. So that means he did something really, really significant. The Gomorrah cites another statement extolling the virtue of Abraham. Right? As Rob said, even Daniel's prayers were only answered on the account of Abraham, as is stated. And now... God, listen, God, to the prayer of your servant and to the supplication and cause your face to shine upon your desolate temple for the sake of the Lord. The verse should have said, and cause your face to shine upon your desolate temple for your sake, as Daniel was addressing the Lord. But he actually said, for the sake of the Lord. And so the rabbis derived from that. This verse contains an illusion that the prayer should be accepted for the sake of Abraham, who called you Lord. Daniel utilized the name of God in order to evoke Abraham's virtue and enhance his prayer. So what's interesting is we we haven't read Daniel yet, so we haven't read it. Well, we read it a long time ago. But Daniel, of course, has amazing things happen to him. When he prays to God, he gets saved from going into the furnace. He gets saved from the lion's den. He he gets amazing things for him um, in the land of in Babylonia. But the, what the rabbis say is that. He only got his prayers answered because of Abraham, and specifically because he invoked Abraham, and he used the same kind of formula that Abraham did. So even, again, Daniel's even later, and the rabbis know that he is really one of the latest 
eight or people that are mentioned in the Bible. You know, one of the last great heroes of the Bible. Because remember, Daniel lives 500 years after King David. So now they basically said that even into Daniel's time, people are still essentially, every Jew essentially, because by saying Daniel, they're saying like everyone from Abraham to Daniel is getting prayers answered only because of Abraham's relationship with God and the fact that Abraham took that extra step of referring to God in that kind of personal way. Which again, not only does he not get punished for, we all get rewarded for when we pray. So, that's one interesting teaching. So the rabbis have now introduced Daniel's prayer. We're going to get back to that. But first, we got another teaching from Rabbi Yochanan, who also, again, is quoting Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai, what we call, who we call the Rashbai. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon Ben Yochai, from where is it derived that one must not placate a person while the person is in the throes of anger? Anger, as it is stated, my face will go and I will give you rest. So, um, What does that tell us? You can't let, and I think we kind of talked about this already. Uh, when, when God got mad at the Israelites, Moses asked him to ask God. Um, for started asking God for things, and and God says to Moses, "Let me calm down." And so the lesson the rabbis take away from that is that whenever you're dealing with somebody who's angry, let them calm down first. Don't talk to them while they're angry. And don't even placate them. Don't even try to make them feel good when they're in the throes of their anger. Let them calm down first. Even God, again, needed to calm down. So if God needs to calm down, again, and God can see everything and knows everything and still gets kind of angry, human beings who don't have God's amazing power and control, we really need to calm down. So don't talk to somebody when they're angry. Just throw that out because, again, another one of Rabbi Yohanan's statements, another great idea, another little idea. But let's get back to these ideas of our prayers. 
And this one is, uh, this starts to get really interesting. Because as I said, it shows us that our ancestors who were women also prayed, and they prayed in very special ways. Rabbi Yochanan said in the name of Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai, from the day that the Holy One, blessed be he, created the world, no one thanked the Holy One, blessed be he, until Leah came and thanked him. As it says in Genesis, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she said, this time I will give thanks to God. And thus he was called Yehuda. The name, right, Yehuda means to thank God. Yehuda means thank, thank God. The word Hoda or Again, Hodatanu, saying thank you, or Odeh, I will thank. That's a really important idea. Uh, and of course, it's the name of our ancestor, Judah, thanking God. But if Abraham was the first person to call God by name, use the name Adonai, Leah is the first person to ever thank God. So Abraham, for all his amazing things and all the great things that he did with God, and showing faith and opening up God to everybody. Leah is the first human being to ever thank God. So the rabbis just did something again. That's why I say, don't tell me that this was done by a woke generation that is trying to be inclusive and trying to uh, balance everything out. Again, I'm not saying that the Talmud is not patriarchal and it is not male focused. But within the context of that, the rabbis just did something amazing which is that they gave full credit to our ancestor Leah by saying she's the first human being that ever expressed thanks to God. First time we ever had that phrase. I will thank you, God. So who's the first human being that ever in the Bible says, thank you, God? Leia. Abraham didn't do it. Isaac didn't do it. Rebecca didn't do it. Adam and Eve didn't do it. No, they didn't do it. Fine, okay, you're right. We don't know that they never did, but the Bible is pointing out, but the, the rabbis point out that at least the Bible, which is our only recollection of these conversations, she's dead. Now, again, what do we do? Never 
Piper says that Noah got out of the ark and said, thank you, God, you saved me. Uh, which is interesting, by the way, because it shows that he wasn't as developed of a person as Abraham was, which we've already discussed. But here, you can make the argument that Leah is even, to some extent, more developed than Abraham, because Leah not only recognizes God, but says, I will give thanks to God. So our rabbis recognize that. They recognize that this woman opened up another avenue of prayer for us, which is praying in a thankful mode to God. Yeah. So again, you can make the point, you know, so somebody could have thanked God before. We don't have a record of it. So, Thank, thank you, God. Well, what's, what's interesting is, okay, maybe, but what the rabbis are also expressing is, is that Abraham is the first person that God that God is able to establish a relationship to basically say, here's how people can connect with me, if you will. Now, it only took another two generations, Abraham, right, and then Isaac, and then Isaac's son, Jacob is married to Leah. So it's only two generations later. It took 20 generations in the Bible to get to Abraham. It took two generations to get from Abraham to Leah. But they're basically saying that human beings have now developed a sense not only of fear of God, faith in God, but thanks of God. And that's an interesting idea. And it's one that could, you can make the argument, yeah, that makes sense. You know, people had to develop a relationship. Human, humanity had to develop a way of connecting with God and talking with God that would allow for um, maybe our aunt, I mean, the interesting thing about this is there seems to be an understanding that you know, our ancestors might have talked to God. There, there was a time that maybe we were developing better connection to God. Which is an interesting idea that that can actually progress over time and not get worse. You know, because our look, most of you, most of the rest of humanity had an idea that our ancestors were godlike, and we keep getting weaker and weaker and weaker. The Jewish people are the first people that we know of who not only have a concept of God, but 
concept, but also have a concept of humanity that we're not going in the wrong direction. I would argue that that, by the way, is what makes Judaism at least as unique as that. And we talked about on Shavuot, the idea that we can have a covenant with God is a whole nother level of of evolution in, in, in theology, which is that human beings have a relationship with God where there's an agreement that we actually do things and God does things. And there's a covenant, which is another development later on. But at least at this stage, what's so cool is that um, we understand that our ancestors started seeing this now. Tangential to the mention of Leah's son Judah, and the reason for his name, so we just learned how Judah got his name. The Gemara explains in the sources for other names, including Reuben, who is Judah's older brother, right? Comes Reuben, then Shimon, then Levi, then Judah. Rabbi Eleazar said, Reuben's name should be considered a prophecy by Leah, as Leah said, see, Re'u, the difference between my son, Beni, and the son of my father-in-law, Esau, the son of Isaac. So look at what my son does versus what Isaac's son did is her father, right? Isaac's son, Esau. Why? Because even though Esau knowingly sold his birthright to his brother Jacob, as it is written, and he sold his birthright to Jacob, Nonetheless, what is written about him, Esau hated Jacob. Esau was not only angry over Isaac's blessing, but he was angry about another matter as well. And it is as written, and he said, it is, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has supplanted me twice? He took my birthright, and now, behold, he's taken my blessing. Despite having sold his birthright, he refused to, link, to relinquish it. So what is it saying is that Esau still held a grudge against Jacob. He took the, he took the obviously, the inheritance from him for the bowl of soup. The stew, whatever, the lentil stew. And now he took away the blessing. And and Jacob and Esau is still bearing a grudge, which I think actually kind of makes sense, but uh, he hadn't let go. He hadn't let go of it. And what the rabbis are essentially saying is nobody forced him to do that. He did it. He sold his birthright for a bowl of soup. He spurned his own birthright. So what's this have to do with Reuben? My son Reuben even though Joseph took his birthright from him by force, 
as is written, the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was firstborn. But since he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the sons of Israel. That's what Chronicles says. Nevertheless, he was not jealous of them, as it is written, when Joseph's brothers sought to kill him, and Reuben heard, and he saved him from their hands, saying, let us not take his life. What's it telling us is that Reuben, who did a really bad thing by sleeping with Bilhah, Right? The Bible says in Genesis that he slept, that's where it says he defiled his father's bed. That's when he sleeps with Reuben, sleeps with Bilhah, with the concubine, right? Jacob's concubine. Jacob had two wives, Leah and Rachel, and remember Leah is Leah and Rachel are her sisters. Each of them have a handmaid, Bilhah and Zilpah. And uh, according to the Bible, Reuben had sex with Bill, which was not good. And it's one of the reasons why, again, according to the Bible, and the book of Chronicles says, that's why he lost his birthright. He was the oldest son, and he lost it to Joseph, the youngest son. Now, we know that Joseph, to some extent, got it because he was his father's favorite. But the Bible doesn't really just say that. It actually says that, he, that as much as Joseph and his two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, become tribes in their own right, They they get their own. They get essentially what would have been Reuben's position. Reuben lost it. Reuben did, it wasn't just Joseph earned it. Reuben lost it. And so the Bible reminds us of that. The difference is, and what the Bible just, what the Palm just said, is the story of the Bible actually, even on a straightforward way of presenting this, and even though, again, the book of Chronicles, which is very late in the Bible, it comes in our Bible at the end of the book, even though the story kind of holds this great sway over the entire biblical narrative, there's also a really important lesson here, which is that Reuben never took vengeance and never, never despises Joseph for it. And on the contrary, is one of the brothers who tries to save his life. So he knew he lost it. He knew he lost the birthright at that point, and he still is the one brother. Judah was the other one. Judah is the one who says, let's sell him. But Reuben was the one who says, just keep me here. And we'll come back. And and I mean, don't kill him. We can't kill him. Reuben comes back to save him. In 
finds and he's gone. So it seems as though Reuben wanted to save him, was going to secretly save him from the rest of the brothers in his own way, but then Judah sells him. Um, Reuben is the hero of that story to some extent, and they're saying, look, Reuben Reuben had every reason of, of all the brothers. Reuben had the most reason to kill him, and he didn't. So they're saying, look at the difference between Reuben and Esau. And to some extent, they're saying, look at the difference between Jews and Edomites, Jews and the Gentile world. That's the difference. Now look, there's a certain, obviously, a certain sense of prejudice there. But there is an interesting thing, which is that what keeps the Jewish people together is only if we don't destroy ourselves. Esau essentially destroyed the family. Esau couldn't be part of this family. Because he hated Jacob so much. He said he wanted to kill him. And even though he doesn't kill him when he give when given him a chance, they never fully reconcile. They can't live together. Only when the tribes can live together do we have a nation. And what's our nation made of? The descendants of Reuben and the descendants of Joseph. Whatever animosity that deserves to be there, or I don't want to say deserves to be there, but any animosity that's there, that could be there, they, came, they overcame it. which to some extent, again, the only way you can create a community is if you can keep these different pieces together. So, that's what it says is the difference between Reuben and Esau. The difference between Jacob's family and his father's family. So if you want to know the, the evolution of, of the people, again, Abraham had many kids, according to the Bible. Isaac had two. They couldn't even stay together. Jacob has 12. And even though they had a lot of fights, even though they had about yeah, 12 men, one girl, even though they had a lot of fights, and even though it didn't look very good, they reconcile, they forgive each other, and they get together. And they become our, they are their ancestors. And then obviously there's a lesson there for a people today, our nation, the Jewish nation, but also the American nation too. Now, we read, we read about Reuben. 
well, yeah, but even Shem's family doesn't all stay together. The Semites clearly didn't come together. Right? If they did, they wouldn't be killing each other today. Right? Because there's no question the Semites would have included, would include the Arabs, which is one of the reasons why Arabs said they can't be anti Semitic because their descendants are just it's ridiculous because everyone knows that anti Semitism is Jew hatred. That's why, again, we're not using the term anti Semitism anymore, but we're using the term Jew hatred because anti Semitism is a fancy word for what it is, and very clearly, what's a Semite? I don't want to get in arguments with what set of people what Semites are. Everyone knows what anti Semitism means, but if they don't want to use it and they want to play games with it, let's just call it what it is, which is Jew hatred. So, now that we've talked about names, the rabbis are going to throw out another name, and now we're going to go back to some women. So, continuing on the topic of names, the Gemara asks, what is the meaning of the name Ruth? We just read about her at Shavuot. Right? David's great-grandmother the convert to Judaism, is such a righteous woman that we actually not only read her story in Shavuot, but we quote her words when someone converts. Your people shall be my people. Your God will be my God. Right? Where you go, I will go. Right? That's Ruth. Uh, what's the meaning of the name Ruth? Rabbi Yochanan right, said that she had the privilege that David, who inundated the Holy One, blessed be he with songs and praises, would descend from her. The name Ruth, root, is etymologically similar in Hebrew to the word to inundate, riva, which again, you wouldn't necessarily see that in the word uh, um, to inundate, but it's connected. I mean, the, the the letters are, are the etymologically somewhat connected. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a stretch for what the name Ruth means, but they basically says that pouring out, inundating, is what her name is. The the what what the basis of her name is and who inundated God with praises no, none other than her descendant David. Okay. So look at this one. Regarding the basic assumption that these homiletic interpretations, which is a fancy way of saying you've taught us these really nice 
lessons, rabbis. You've taught us these, these great takeaway lessons. Our allusions to one's future, the Gemara asks, from where do we derive that the name affects one's life? Rabbi Eliezer said the verse says, go and seek the works of the Lord who has made desolations shall mote upon the earth. Do not read the name, do not read the word shamot, but rather read the word shemot, names. The names given to the people are therefore the works of the Lord upon the earth. What is that telling us? That our names reflect who we are. Well, that's a pretty interesting idea. The names that are given to us are essentially God's work in this world. God says, look at the people, look at, read Psalm 46, not Shemot, Shemot, which is not good, desolations, that's the, the vocalization of that, but Shemot. So, we are God's our names reflect this. Now, some people would say, I don't really think my name reflects reflects what I'm doing or what God wants me to do. I don't really think my name is the right name for me. Guess what? People change them. And where do they get the permission to change it? Essentially from this passage in the Talmud, which is if the name is not your name, there's a name out there, and sometimes it takes a while, sometimes it takes into adulthood for people to, to understand that they take on a name. Now, of course, that's hard because when someone takes on a name later in life, The people who knew them by that other name have a hard time remembering to call them by that name. I've had friends who've done that, and I'm like, I, it's hard for me to remember. Uh, obviously, it's it's a tough one, but. Uh, yeah, Cal Greenfield started going by Arthur, but no one, but like people didn't like you were never sure really what to call him. Yeah, yeah, his name used to be Arthur, and then. He was Cal, and then he went back to art. I don't know. Listen, I think our, I think Arthur. I don't know. Look, I think the reason they changed his name, I have to check with Hedy again on this since you brought it up. But 
people used to have their names changed at birth or right after birth. If they were sickly, people would have their names changed because there was an idea that if you change the person's name, that the angel of death couldn't find them anymore. So it was a very common practice. The very common practice with people if they would change their name. Yeah, but he he may not have done that because the angel of death was coming after him. So, so he went by yeah. So the people do that. And there's nothing like in Judaism, it happens all the time because Avraham is originally Avraham and his name is changed to Avraham. That he has a hey added to it because God essentially puts his name into it and changes his name. Um, but Jacob becomes Israel. I mean, the name is not even close to being the same name. So the idea of somebody changing their name later in life. So the people that I know, most of the people that I know who have changed their names are rabbis, actually, who either totally take on a different name or they adopt their Hebrew name. And I know other people who are not rabbis who said, I like my Hebrew name better than I like my English name. I'm going to start using my, my, my Hebrew name. And I know people who have done that. And not just because they've gone to Israel, but because they live here and they want to know. They wanted to, they wanted to go. I, I, one, of, one of my rabbis growing up, his name was Morris. I never knew him as Morris because he was always Moshe. He was my teacher. And he went by Moshe uh, because he didn't like Morris. So he went by Moshe. He changed his name in the 60s to Moshe or early 70s. So people, people have done that. Um, if you want, There's people who do that. I mean, look, that that's there are definitely are people who when they change their their sexual uh, identity, gender identity, that their gender identity, they change their name. Uh, I know a lot of people who've done that. But um, but there are people who feel that they're not the name that they want to be called is not the name that they were given at birth. Yeah. Well, I ask people, I, I ask all the people, I ask people all the time because, at, at, you know, first of all, like 
if I'm talking to somebody, you know, like some, some, somebody says, hey, you know, or oftentimes like at a funeral, the card will say, you know, hey, this person's name was, you know, Robert or well, let's say Richard, whatever, and and they and and they, uh, I always know the person was not Richard. It was Rick or Rich or Dick or whatever. So it's like you don't want to call them by a name that nobody called them by, but it does happen where people have. Um, names that you, you, you wouldn't even know was their names. It was not their given name, and they're known by it. And so you got to, you, you know, you got to treat the people with the respect of what they want to be called. But what we saw, we understand this, the rabbis at least throw it out. That's a that's a that's one of God's miracles is the names of people are known by, and there's a meaning to it. Remember, every name in the Bible, the rabbis are they, like they know. Look, the Bible oftentimes says what the name is. The, the name we went back to with Yehuda, it says, Leah, uh, Leah said, I will thank God. I'll name him. And every time one of those kids are, are born, right, Joseph, I will, I, you know, I'll have an addition. Like everybody, everybody's name meant something, and the Bible tells us what the name means. They knew Hebrew, but they actually said what the name meant, and they and they said why the, the why that name was given. So. Names are very important in the Bible, and it goes all the way through. Look, really, Genesis is where they explain names. They don't really, well, that's not true. Moses explains in Exodus why he named his son Gershom, because that was a stranger there. Um, but it doesn't. It uh, doesn't happen really much outside of of um, of of through Genesis, through uh, ex beginning of Exodus, but uh, the, it, when Genesis does it, it's almost as if to tell us these are the Genesis of the names, right? These are where your names come from, folks. This is the people that you're named after. You're named after these people, and these are what these names mean. This is why these people have these names. So, here's a great lesson from, yeah, Oh yeah. But but almost every culture, Jesse, had a thing of people taking names. Like look, every Roman emperor took a name when they became an emperor and it usually like was part of their family 
family name, but like they took names that were yeah. meaningful for them. No, but it was Absolutely. There's definitely part of that, but what you're what you're saying is, I aspire to be like this. Well, usually, the the Roman emperors did it to sometimes honor the person. They, that they wanted to pay tribute to. But look at the popes. Every pope that becomes the pope takes on a name. They had a guy had a name. I want to be, I want to be Pope Francis. He had a name before he, he likes to say, you like to say Francis and you wanted to be Francis. Exactly. King Charles he kept his name. But you can also pick which part of your name you want. He's like five ten names. I don't even know how many names he has. He's got so many names as everyone knew he was going to be Charles, but Anyways, yeah, people can change their can at, at coronation would take on a name, and that's been going on for a long time. Uh, and as we mentioned, there's even kings in the Bible who have their names changed. Uh, in the Bible, by the time of kings, doesn't really explain why. Ezekiel, we assume that when he 
He's talking about these things. He's talking about tribes from the north, primarily like Scythian Sarmatian tribes that, that were making inroads during the 500s that were attacking the, the, the they were causing chaos in the world and and many people think that we don't know for sure but Ezekiel definitely thought that there was going to be a war coming that these guys were participating in that were they were that they were They, they were part of the of the of the upheaval that was going to happen in his lifetime. Uh, did it play a role in the end of the Babylonian era, which was again the Persians conquering? You know conquering the Babylonians and then ending our exile in the Babylonian exile? Maybe. But it doesn't matter for us in our time and for 2,000 years, the rabbis have been talking and the Christians have been talking about this as a battle that's still yet to happen. And everyone said, well, you know, 50 years ago, it was the Russians. It was the Soviet Union. And then it was, well, now it's, then it was the Chinese. And now it's the Russians again. But the war of Gog and Magog was going to come somewhere from that area of where Russia is today. When Russia was getting along with us, it wasn't Russia anymore, it was China. But it is all part of... Uh, what people would say is the end times. But what, the, what Jesus said is that the worst, worst, the worst situation is what happens when your own family goes off the rails. That's worse than Gog and Magog. So that's bad. That's the worst thing. That's it is it in the Quran as well. Yeah, but it's there because it's in our Bible, right? And it becomes the it, yeah. Nobody really knows, you know, who God was or or. And again, originally it wasn't two people. It was Gog from a land called Magog. But in, in later on, it's two individuals. Look, it's it's part of it's part of once it was in the Christian Bible in the Book of Revelation. It became an established fact. But again, the Christians didn't make it up. They didn't just put it in there from nowhere. The rabbis were talking about it too. Right? The people of the Dead Sea Scroll community of Qumran were talking about the wars of the sons of dark versus the sons of the sons of light. But here's the interesting thing. The rabbis say family troubles are worse. And here's why they say it. There's the psalm that we just read. As it is stated, the psalm of David when he 
fled from his son Absalom. And it is written right after that, Lord, how numerous are my enemies. Many have risen against me. While concerning the war of Gog and Magog, which is alluded to in the second chapter of Psalms, it is written, why are the nations in an uproar and why do the people speak for naught? The kings of earth stand up and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. He, he that sits in heaven laughs. The Lord mocks them, which is from Psalm 2, the Psalm just before it. Psalm 2 seems to be making light of Gog and Magog. Psalm 2 seems to be saying, you got nothing to worry about, about those other nations of the world that would make war against us. You don't have to worry about those. God laughs at those. Yet, in the chapter describing uh, the war of Gog and Magog, had numerous of my enemies, is it not written as it is not as difficult as raising a wayward son like Absalom? Regarding the opening phrase of the psalm, which serves as a title, the Gemara wonders, it is said a psalm of David when fleeing his son Absalom. A psalm of David? Shouldn't it say a lament of David? So if David running away from his troublesome son, Absalom is so bad, why does it say a song of David? Shouldn't it say a lament of David? Shouldn't it say not a, a psalm, a song of praise, but shouldn't it be a lament? If we just heard that having your son's fight is like the, having your son fight against you, Having your son fight against you is like the apocalypse. Why does the psalm that talk about Absalom not start off with this is a song of sadness? It's a fair question to ask. The rabbis are now throwing out a question Again, that we just read Psalm 3, and I'll show it to you just a little bit. Psalm 3, it says, a psalm of David when he fled from his son Absalom. O oh Lord, my foes are so many. Many are those who attack me. That seems pretty serious. Right? It seems pretty serious that David is dealing with big troubles, even though numerous would just be absolute. So it seems like this is pretty bad. And you just said it was bad. So why does it say it's bad? And now we're going to get into a really interesting theological answer. All 
And this one, yeah, well, let's look at it. Rabbi Shimon ben Avi Shalom, which is interesting, his name is Avi Shalom, and that's Absalom. Rabbi Shimon ben Avi Shalom said in a parable, so what is this similar? It is similar to a person about whom a promissory you know, note was issued, stating that he must repay a debt to the lender. Before he repaid it, he was despondent, worried how will he manage to repay the debt. After he repaid it, he was glad. Let's just explain that first. That's nothing earth shattering, right? You understand that. So you already understand the concept. You have a debt and you haven't paid it off, you're worried whether you're going to be able to pay it off. Right? You pay it off. We talked about this recently, right? What's one of the greatest feelings in the world? Paying off your mortgage. You get this huge debt off your back. It's usually our biggest debt in the world. And we get that debt off of our back. Fine, but you know the point. That's not... When you get a debt off your back, you feel like you've accomplished something. You feel, whew, I don't ever have to worry about how I'm going to pay that. Everybody gets that, right? Now check this out. You already heard. That's what David feels like. So, too, this was the case with David. When the Holy One, blessed to be, he told him through Nathan the prophet, right? This goes back to the beginning of uh, 2 Samuel. Once David is king, and he does this horrible thing of taking Bathsheba, somebody else's wife, and getting the other guy killed. 